Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Daniel Green. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Geography and International Development at the University of Chester. His research focuses on numerical modeling of high intensity surface water flood events in urban areas. So any questions around urban areas, this is the person to ask. Um, Daniel also uses crowdsourcing methodologies. I know some of you are interested in crowdsourcing. So um, to obtain external validation data for numerical models uh, and has extensive experience of using GIS methodologies to model the impact of fluvial and surface water flood events on emergency responders accessibility at a city scale. So you know any questions around that area after you hear his presentation, uh, you can go ahead and ask him. Okay, so the floor is all yours, Daniel. Could you please share your screen with us? Yeah, will do. Um, there we go. Can you see? It's it working. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Can you make it full screen your presentation? Yeah. Okay. I've made it full screen. Has it updated or? Um, yes, we can see it. There we go. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, Amrata. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, so, yeah, my name is Daniel Green. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Chester in uh, the UK. And today I'm going to be talking about um, an evaluation of city scale accessibility of emergency responders operating during flood events. Um, I'm going to be using the case study of the city of Leicester, um, which is in the East Midlands of the UK. Um, we also did some work taking this forward um, in the city of York. So I'll mention that briefly at the end. Um, but yeah, specifically on how flooding affects um, the accessibility and um, the tra traversing of emergency services across um, the city. So as we all know, has, has that changed? Yeah, there we go. As we all know, um, so floods are the most damaging natural hazards in the UK. Um, and just to give you some brief statistics, we have about 5 million people, so about a 12th of the UK population, which are at risk from fluvial, surface water, or coastal flooding. Um, fluvial flooding, where a river overtops and bursts its banks onto a floodplain. Pluvial or surface water flooding caused by very intense, high intensity uh, downpours of precipitation, which are uh, directly applied to the catchment, which cannot be infiltrated into the ground or evacuated by drainage systems, be those natural or artificial. So things like natural kind of drainage channels or artificial things like sewer networks or sustainable urban drainage systems, um, a bit like Faith talked about um, earlier. Um, there's also groundwater flooding and coastal flooding. I'm not going to be talking about those too much today um, because of the the geography of the city of Leicester it's um, it's directly in the center of the UK so it's as far as like away from the coast as possible like as it possibly can so there would be a, a lot of trouble if uh, we're at risk of coastal flooding in the city of Leicester um, and then also yeah just going back to that first point about five million people being at risk of flooding um, surface water flooding is probably the most like um, widely spread um, hazard. So about two thirds of UK flood risk is attributed to surface water flooding due to its kind of widespread nature. So we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Um, so the flood risk in Leicester, I'll just wait for that to change on your screen. Um, I've changed slide on here, but I, I think maybe it's still loading. There we go. Um, yeah, so these maps um, are from the Environment Agency, um, which are kind of like our governmental organisation, which look at um, kind of all in things environmental. Um, and they show the fluvial and the surface water flood risk across the city. And you can see the areas in the fluvial flood risk. Um, there's areas of high probability of flooding. So one in 100 years or 1% greater annual uh, exceedance probability of flooding. And then we've also got areas of medium probability. Um, and then also looking at the surface water flood risk, we could see this is very distributed um, spatially across the city with areas of high um, 
annual exceedance probability of flooding. So uh, according to DEFRA framework, um, it was ranked 16th out of 4,215 settlements in England at risk of pluvial flooding. Um, and the environment a estimates um, about 3,700 properties at risk within the principal urban area of the city of Leicester at risk of uh, surface water um, and fluvial flooding. So this is just within the, the kind of the principal urban area is the main uh, kind of area of the city. So areas which lie outside would be at flood risk as well. So that um, figure is going to be greater as well. Um, and then if we look more specifically, you can see the principal urban area is highlighted by that black uh, line on the map. But if we look uh, here, we can see that there's a lot of, uh, so there's 26 surface water flood hotspots across the city. And one of them includes the Leicester Royal Infirmary, which is the main hospital uh, within the city of Leicester. Um, there's also a lot of um, areas, so you see Belgrave um, Road just up from the north of the centre of the city, um, which is within a vulnerable, like very highly vulnerable area of the city where there's a lot of uh, low income population, um, which would be susceptible to flooding. And I think the, the council are having lots of issues with trying to communicate um, the risk of flooding to them. Um, in particular, I think there's a lot of um, kind of people that have moved over from um, kind of lower income countries um, where they don't really understand the risk of urban flooding um, and they're maybe used to like their land flooding every year so um, the council have found it quite difficult to kind of navigate that and um, communicate the risk of flooding and like what um, kind of personal protection um, to their property they can they can do to protect themselves in a flood event. Uh, but yes, so we have 26 surface water flood hotspots across the city, including the um, the main hospital. And then if we look at the the hospital, um, kind of worryingly, you can see that a lot of the critical infrastructure and very expensive infrastructure, things like the power, the communications, like the radio towers, the um, the, the kind of the paging system to for doctors to communicate. Uh, heating, MRI equipment, and lots of, lots of medical equipment. Uh, the infrastructure is in the basement level tunnels, and you can see this figure down uh, down here showing the steps which go down into that. And you can imagine like lots of water flowing into this in the event of um, a, a flood. Um, so I mean, it's yeah, very important to cr uh, kind of protect this critical infrastructure across the city. So that just gives you a brief overview of the direct impacts of uh, flooding so for like actual areas flooded um, and that's kind of been quite widely considered in the UK context however the indirect or cascading impact of flooding hasn't really been um, as like well um, studied so that's very understudied so just to like kind of represent that you can see on this diagram here you've got like the flooding which you know which is the direct impact but then that will lead to a blocked road network um, and then ultimately that could r result in delayed or impacted or completely cut off emergency response um, if, if emergency services were operating um, within or during uh, or after a flood even as well. So this just shows that these kind of indirect or cascading, uh, cascading flood um, impacts which may happen. And I think it's really important to study these as well. So the key research questions that we looked at during this study uh, were, so the first one, how can existing data sets be applied to assist strategic planning and operational response for flood situations? Um, the second one was, what are the infrastructural bottlenecks within the city of Leicester for emergency response? So where do these kind of areas where we need to focus all efforts to remove floods from those um, because they might be the main kind of critical road networks? Um, which will root emergency response. Um, and then also, how can results be presented in a clear, concise, and easily understandable format to aid decision-making? Um, so it was really the projects that we did. Um, this was when I was at Loughborough University in the UK, and we worked with Environment Agency, um, East Midlands Ambulance Service, um, the Fire and Rescue Service in Leicestershire, um, and then another, like a few other kind of organisations, things like the utility companies as well. Um, 
So we were looking at how existing data sets can like easily obtainable, um, so public data sets which are made available online, how these can be used to assist um, strategic planning and operational response. We didn't want to um, kind of make any any new data. Um, we wanted to use the existing data to see how how much like you know how freely available data could be used to assist in this, and we wanted to again communicate it in a clear. Um, concise and easily understandable format to make sure that um, the people who are going to use this kind of information will be able to quickly understand and act upon um, the information given to them during the event of a flood. Okay, so uh, the next slide just looks at project partner involvement. So we can see here we've got the, uh, it's just playing catch up, there we go. Um, so the East Midlands Ambulance Service and when they're responding to a uh, kind of a critical event, um, they have to get there within eight minutes um, under a high priority response. So this could include things like a cardiac arrest, a heart attack or something very serious where there's a, like, a life threatening um, problem. And then for kind of lower priority responses, they should respond within a 20 minutes um, period. Um, and talking to the emergency responders, we found that they had a number of kind of strategic uh, standby points for proximity to potential emergencies and this was calculated kind of by them by a big computer system. Um, Leicester and, Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service, um, they would have a blue light response um, within 10 minutes um, or less um, and then kind of less serious incidents would be within 20 minutes. So f um, this kind of gives us a nice framework to work with. Um, so the ambulance service kind of um, mapping their response within an eight minute and a 20 minute time zone and then the fire and rescue service mapping that within a 10 minute and a 20 minute time zone um, and then also speaking to them they mentioned that fire incidents are declining whereas the rescue incidents are actually increasing so things like uh, actually rescuing people from floodwaters you see the picture in the top right I think that might be actually from um, by very close to the University of Chester there was a um, a place in in North Wales called Saint Asaph, which flooded very quite like really quite badly, um, and this just shows the uh, the rescue kind of response of the fire and rescue service. Um, and yeah, so their role during the flood uh, during flood events would be to rescue trapped individuals from flood waters, and it's more of a humanitarian response than their kind of their fire uh, aspect. Um, I'll just briefly skip over this slide here. This just shows um, when it updates on yours. There we go. Um, we really wanted a stakeholder centric kind of view of our project. So co-production of knowledge to try and work with stakeholders and give them um, kind of usable and tangible outputs which they could use. Um, and again, speaking to them, they provide clear, concise, comprehensible data which could be easily acted upon. They didn't want to spend a long time like looking at the data and trying to understand it. They wanted it very, very visual and kind of interactive. Um, and then that led to them kind of saying that they wanted it in map form over tabulated or written forms. And they ultimately like animated data sets as well. So I think they're really, you know, their traditional kind of approach would be to kind of put it in tables and, and graphs and um, kind of written reports. But they just don't simply have the time to, to look over this, especially during a, a flood event. Um, so actually on to kind of the, the results. Um, this just shows a very, very simple network analysis. Um, when it updates on, there you go. Um, so... This shows like a kind of point to point, so point A to point B, uh, routing across the city. And um, we've used here Western Fire and Rescue Station to one of the evacuation centres, um, St Andrew's Methodist Church Evacuation Centre. Um, and you can see here, like under quickest routing, using a network analysis framework under normal conditions, it would take about five minutes for um, the, the the fire. Um, fire appliance to get from point A to point B. Um, however, under a restricted routing, under a kind of flood aware, and I'll go back to that in a second, um, flood aware scenario, you can see that it would take eight minutes, um, which is obviously a 37% increase in distance traveled and a 60% increase in journey duration. So obviously impacting on the emergency response. But this does, if we compare it back to that previous slide, it does inf like, the flood aware, what I mean by that is they turn left rather than right. Um, 
at the, the fire station entrance. So they instinctively are prepared and they know the areas um, that are impacted by flooding. But what we might see is this restricted routing and a kind of flood uninformed um, situation. So you can see here that they drive towards a flood and then they encounter the flood waters and then they have to navigate and route around it again. Um, so this takes 15 minutes. So it's a 200 percent plus increase in the journey duration and over 100 percent increase in the distance traveled. Um, but then obviously this excludes decision time of avoiding flood traversing the route, things like traffic as well aren't incorporated within this simple framework. Um, so that was kind of like the background of what we wanted to uh, to look at. Um, but we wanted to take that one step further and look at it on the city scale. So um, when your slide updates, it's just, there we go. Um, so this shows the city of Leicester. Um, you can see kind of the, the, the kind of the burgundy red line showing the extent of the city um, and the grey lines there show an ordin ordnance survey which is our kind of mapping company um, a data set called the integrated transport network or itn data um, and this is basically like line gis point uh, well gis line files which um, considers things and it can, it can be put inputted into a network analysis framework um, so it can consider things like speed restric uh, restrictions mandatory turn restrictions, so like turn right, turn left, one-way roads, um, but it does obviously ignore congestion and traffic and things like human behaviour, decision-making as well. Um, but this is really useful because we can input that into GIS and use it almost like a sat-nav. Um, and then also the points show these kind of emergency service locations and vulnerable locations. So these stars here that I've highlighted, um, these show the fire and rescue stations across the city. So we have, uh, and then if we start mapping a kind of polygon response, um, you can see here. So within a 10 minute time zone, um, you can see that Burstall Fire and Rescue up in the north of the city can reach all of these areas. So that's within a 10 minute frame. Um, and then if we just go around the city, so Western Fire and Rescue can reach a, a large area of the, uh, the west of the city. Southern Fire and Rescue Station, um, it's there. Wigston Fire and Rescue Station, the purple um, shape file in polygon format. Uh, Eastern Fire and Rescue Station there. And finally, the Wigston Fire and Rescue Station. So we can see that about, so this is under a completely uninhibited no flood scenario. And we can see that about 100% of the city is uh, accessible completely. So there's no areas of inaccessibility or um, areas which are completely restricted because there aren't any kind of flood inputs um, inputted into the model. Um, also, you can see that there's kind of a high degree of uh, overlap between the, uh, the, the between the, the fire and rescue station um, kind of service areas. So that indicates kind of a high level of resilience as well. Because of that overlap, it means that if a uh, an incident happened in one of these areas where there was overlap from a number of stations, then you wouldn't like it wouldn't matter if one of the, the fire and rescue stations uh, were already like busy with a, another situation because someone else would be able to attend to it. Um, so you can see where we're going. So um, the next step was to so for surface water or the pluvial um, kind of flooding. I'll show you how we uh, inputted those kind of. Um, those flood restrictions. So firstly, we, we inputted uh, surface water design storm uh, model depths of varying magnitudes. And to do this, we use the one in 20, one in 100, and one in 1,000 year flood event. So we had a big spread from like, you know, one in 20, it could, it could happen to one in 1,000, very extreme flood event. And uh, you'd be worried if that, that happened. Um, so using those, we, we got the, uh, the data from the city of Leicester, their flood report, um, their flood modeling data. Um, and then we kind of did an excess removal. So we removed the flood extent, which didn't intercept the road network because we're not interested in that. Um, we're only interested in the flooding that crosses the, the path of the road network and would act as a restriction. Um, the next step as well, like you'd expect that um, flood depths of say five centimeters wouldn't really make that much of a difference. I know the Environment Agency uh, in the UK say you shouldn't ever really drive through 
floodwaters of say 10, 15 centimeters because that can uh, you don't know what's under there. It could be that there's a there's drains lifted up and um, because of surcharging of the the sewer network. And then if you're driving along, you hit the drain and obviously you're going to be stuck in floodwaters. Um, but through speaking to the stakeholders, the fire and rescue and the ambulance services, they said that they would generally drive through knee deep um, kind of floodwaters. So we removed um, flood depths of like anything less than 25 centimeters was removed um, as a restriction. And then finally, there was like a, an inspection phase where we removed all unrealistic restrictions. So this incorporated things around bridges where the, uh, the DEM, which they would have used to uh, simulate the flooding, wasn't correctly or adequately represented. Um, so it meant, meant that the, uh, the kind of the flood restrictions were slightly a little bit off uh, around flooded like bridges. Um, so for the one in 100 year surface water flood event, we went from about 201,000 polygon restrictions to down to 10,000 because of this uh, kind of restriction and um, cutting down of the um, the restrictions. Um, so yeah, back to, to this map, you can see this is normal response under like kind of no flood conditions. But if we introduce the surface water flood restrictions here, um, so this you see here in the blue uh, with the black outline, these are the, and highlighted again in the, the right, these are one in 20 year surface water flood restrictions. Um, and you can see actually that there's quite a big impact, even from the one in 20 year surface water flood event across the city of emergent, like, you know, affecting emergency responders. So we go down from about 100% city coverage within this 10 minute time frame down to 65, uh, 66% um, city coverage. So a third of the city is kind of um, the coverage within a 10 minute frames uh, time frame is cut off. Um, again, we see areas of inaccessibility going up to 6%. And this includes things that like road network that is actually directly cut off um, by flood, like by floodwaters or covered by floodwaters, but then also like things like cul-de-sacs and roads that are actually blocked because uh, the floodwaters restrict access into that road. Um, so you, if we look at this kind of little uh, cutout, you can see some of these areas like which are flooded, and that results in like a blocked uh, accessibility to other parts of the cities. Uh, and then if we introduce the one in a hundred year surface water flood get event, we see kind of a more extreme cutting off of the uh, the city. So down to 40% city coverage within this 10 minute high priority response. Um, and now 13% uh, in accessibility across the city. Um, and then this one in a thousand year flood event, which is kind of the extreme uh, flood event, uh, you can see that about 25% of the city, so down to a quarter of the city, is, is reachable within a 10 minute time zone. And now 31% uh, of the city is completely inaccessible. You can't reach it, um, either flooded directly by flood waters or completely uh, restricting movement to some of the streets. So I think that shows like, obviously as you increase flood magnitude, you see um, an increase in the, uh, the kind of the inaccessibility of emergency responders. And I think that's really important to to consider and you can see that there's some areas where it's uh, really important to kind of maintain that um that accessibility because they're kind of key um key areas which if restricted then that could cut off large areas specifically that burstal point in just to the north like just in the center the north of the center of the city you can see that there's quite dramatic areas of uh, flooding and 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 these areas kind of link up to those flood hotspots as well that um, I showed in the at the start of the presentation. Um, so the same kind of thing is seen for um, the East Midlands Ambulance Service. So instead of, again, we used eight minutes time frame for the high priority response instead of the 10 minute, which we've used for, um, for the fire and rescue. But you, I just flicked through these very quickly. You see from like a 90% city coverage within the uh, the no flood scenario, uh, fifty percent city coverage when you introduce a one in twenty year surface water flood event. Um, so that really affects the the ambulance um, 
accessibility across the, the city and would have massive impacts on emergency response if there's no kind of planning um, or, or removal of floodwaters. Um, one in a hundred year, again, you see an increase in the, well, like a decrease in the accessibility. And then the one in a thousand year extreme flood, you kind of see about a quarter of the city accessible. And again, you see it operating kind of, uh, some. I mean, some of the ambulance services are completely cut off. Um, Vester Royal Infirmary, again, in the city, like the, the case study with that we talked about at the start, the, the hospital, um, there were a lot of like we modelled a lot of flood waters around that, so it could be actually possible that that uh, East Mid- Midlands that ambulance station actually floods and is cut off completely. Um, so I don't know whether this is going to work over the internet. I've got a little video to show you. It might be that it's I don't know. Uh, are you able to see the animation on that? I click play. It's not actually playing for me. I had a little video which was showing the um, the kind of how flooding changes through time, and you might see that. I mean, we've used these kind of these maximum uh, extents. I think I've sent a, a presentation across to Namarata, so um, hopefully the video will work on on that. If you wanted to go through that afterwards, um, but this was just looking at how like flooding evolves through time and that might affect emergency response um yeah again i've got another video showing uh, that kind of temporal because we've looked at the spatial changes of emergency um response but w- i wanted to show you the the kind of the temporal and how that would change during a, a flood event especially a surface water flood event because um the mechanisms behind fluvial flooding are a lot better understood so we can predict um, the kind of the magnitude and when they're going to happen um, at least you know 48 hours before but for surface water flood events it's much harder to predict this um, and because of the way that they're formed from these very high intensity convective rains fall events um, they form very kind of rapidly and often you don't know where they're going to occur and what magnitude they're going to occur at so they're much more difficult to plan for um, and this this video just showed how the, uh, the the ambulance response polygons changed through time during a one in a hundred year flood event. Um, I think you'll have access to those videos um, after the event. So if you wanted to have a look through those, then um, by, mean, by all means have a look through. And if you've got any questions, then drop them an, e- uh, an email. Um, and then finally, just a comparison between, so we've looked quite in quite detail the surface water flood impacts but i wanted to show you the influence of fluvial so river flooding um there's a river called the river saw in the city of leicester which runs straight through the middle um as you can see from this one in 20 um fluvial flood event um and as you increase the intensity of the fluvial flood event you see this the city kind of splitting into two almost like the east and west of the city um, operating as two different um, urban connotations, um, conurbations. So, it, yeah, really interesting. Um, I would have thought that actually a one in a thousand year flood event would result in a lot larger impact. I think we think of fluvial flooding as, you know, really kind of dramatic and fast and rapid, whereas surface water flooding um, as not really that that impactful. But I think the, the results from this study have shown that actually like the, the indirect impacts of uh, surface water flooding are way more kind of spatially distributed. Um, and because of that spatial distribution across the city, I think actually they're more impactful than, than fluvial um, flooding. Um, obviously, fluvial flooding can impact um, emergency responses we're seeing here. We're seeing like kind of lots of the the smaller streams flooding and actually re- uh, restricting um, emergency response from the ambulance stations. Um, but actually, because of the spatial distribution of surface water f- flooding um, falling across the entirety of the city, whereas the fluvial is restricted mainly to the uh, to the channel of the, the river, I think we see like larger impacts of surface water flooding. Um, 
and then also if you look at the actual river saw in Leicester City um, you can see that it's got quite a large capacity actually so large channel capacity trapezoidal in shape very linear and contained and that results in like a quite high channel conveyance so it's it's able to kind of flood onto this uh, compound channel um, outside of the main actual river channel um, and the capacity is quite quite large actually and contained whereas surface water is kind of quite spread out and not contained um, and actually interacting with the uh, the buildings and kind of people and vehicles within the city um, so yeah I, I, we we did a, a stakeholder event at the uh, the Leicester uh, City Hall so there were about 100 people that attended um, that I think the, the main kind of take-home message were actually people f um, were kind of amazed that surface water flooding had so much impact when people, and the, these were kind of people working in emergency response, working within flooding, working at the within the city, um, kind of in these kind of uh, managerial roles uh, in terms of flood response and then also flood kind of planning. Um, but it opened their eyes up to say, actually, wow, like flooding and the impact of surface water flooding is is very large and it needs to be considered. Um, they were a lot of people were kind of in the mindset that if you live on a hill or if you live far away from a river, then your flood risk is zero. Um, so I think this was really interesting for like a kind of dissemination event of the uh, the kind of the results and we did a bit of kind of like tabletop exercises to kind of put these into context as well and get people thinking about how they would use these resources uh, during and kind of before and after for kind of resilience planning as well um, like you know before during after flood events um, so I'm not sure how I'm doing for time but that concludes my talk and uh, do we have any questions Thank you, Daniel. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I am sure there will be some questions from the students, so I leave the floor open uh, to students. Who would want to go first? <laughs> Shall I turn my uh, camera back on? Yes, please. Can you just, yes. OK. Uh, how do I do this? You can just stop Ooh. sharing and, yeah. Yeah, uh, stop share. There we go. Okay. Back in the room. <laughs> Great. Um, so that is a very interesting presentation. Uh, let me start with the question that I have uh, in mind. Mm, when you are talking about uh, city scale, uh, is it, uh, f first thing is, uh, is, does it have to be city scale, or can can the same thing be done on a larger scale, or even on a smaller scale? I mean, how far we can go with the scale? Yeah, really good question, Amrata. I think um, it, the because we've used the the data, which is kind of openly accessible, um, and the methodology is actually quite simple. I mean, it requires quite a lot of processing and mm -hmm. actually getting hold of the data, but you can apply it to to anywhere. Um, so you could apply it for much larger regions. Um, you could apply it in different countries, different kind of um, areas, cities, rural areas, I think would be interesting to to look at. Um, one in particular is, as well, like you, you don't need to use it for flooding. So you could look at like wildfire and model using that similar methodology, apply that to um, to wildfire. So we, we have a, um, at the end of the presentation, I was going to direct you to two um, publications mm. like based on this. So one using like the, the stuff that I presented today, um, but then also one uh, in the city of York. Um, but at the end of that, we mentioned that you could use it for like wildfires, floods, um, bridge collapse as well. Okay. Um, so I, I think it is widely applicable to other kind of scenarios um, and different scales as well so it doesn't matter whether it's a much smaller kind of scale or whether you're looking at a, like a large county or mm. municipality level um, or different kind of hazards as well so yeah good question um, you, 
this is a very, um, you have worked in, in the city of Leicester, which is obviously in the United Kingdom, which is quite data rich. So mm -hmm. uh, how can we transfer the same knowledge in environments which are not as data rich? What do you suggest, for instance, for Brazil, maybe in rural areas, how do you suggest that the same technology can be transferred? Yeah, um, good question. I, I think it de depends on the data. Obviously, we've gone in, like, you know, trying to apply data that already exists. I'm not entirely sure what uh, data exists for this kind of transport modeling network analysis um, stuff w within Brazil, um, whether some kind of governmental agencies apply like kind of mapping of uh, road networks. It might be that open street map data, you could apply this open street map data, which is obviously kind of crowdsourced and used, like, you know, users contribute to that. So it could be that you use these kind of uh, additional um, crowdsource driven methodologies to obtain data in like non data rich areas. Um, possibly even some kind of uh, remote sensing if, if uh, you can identify roads from from that. Obviously, that doesn't have the, the speed restrictions, turn yeah. restrictions data mm. uh, included in there, but that might be quite a nice, good good start of obtaining that kind of uh, basic level kind of line net network uh, data. Uh, any questions from the floor? What sort of data is available here in, in the context of what Daniel has just uh, mentioned? Uh, is there enough data to perform similar kind of exercise in Brazil? Because you know the best what sort of data is available here. So like Google Maps as well. Um, Google Maps obviously has yeah. the, um, and sat-navs as well. Mm -hmm. um, that that sat-nav data, um, if you can get hold of that, that should do similar. Um, that, that should act in the same method. Do you think that might have an impact on the resolution? Uh, no, because it's uh, rather than like a raster data set, it's using uh, shape files, so just line, okay. line and point files. Mm -hmm. And so, as, like as long as you do have that simplified line, um, line and kind of joins, um, and it's all joined up, okay. then you can use that as a road network. You would need to set the the restrictions so you couldn't have cars going 200 miles per hour <laughs> yeah. down it. So you'd need to set a maximum and a minimum and kind of an average speed and things like that. Um, the turn restrictions, I don't think maybe you would need to, to worry about as much. Okay. But I think the, the speed at which the, the vehicles are traveling along the, the road would be important. OK, OK. So uh, any suggestions from, from the students here? What do you think, uh, how can you use the same technology here in Brazil? What are your suggestions? Anyone has any experience with open data sets here? No? Is there enough availability? Is there enough data from the government? What about transport data set or things like that? Yes, please. <laughs> Uh, the data sets uh, that are available by uh, available by the government is very difficult to work because they do not have a exclusive platform to transmit the data. They are distributed by the by the organs, and uh, sometimes you have to go to the to the to the place to get the data. You cannot get it there online. And uh, it's a lot of bureaucracy, is right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of bureaucracy to get the data. And I, I think that the, the GIS part of the data set is the easiest to, to us, but the government data set is very hard to get. Yeah. OK, that's interesting. That seemed to be a problem for most developing nations. Um, yeah. yeah data availability and accessibility and yeah. those restrictions, yeah. Well, uh, we have to start from somewhere. So it's good to know that there is a technology available and we can use our knowledge and things are happening. Uh, and we will start from what we have and most probably you are the future. So 
hopefully one of some of you will be in the governments and we don't have to go through all those uh, bureaucracy what do you think <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah. thank you so much daniel and that was a lovely Perfect. presentation thank you very much for your participation uh thank and and if uh, any of them have any further questions, I'll uh, send them over to you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Great. All right. Have a lovely day. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, now that we have Daniel's presentation, this is the session which will, where we will discuss a little bit because we didn't have much time uh, to dis discuss how are we going to do all the practicals and how to go about with the presentation and stuff. Uh, so we will start with, again, back to the uh, handout. After the lunch break, uh, there will be a presentation of, on OpenGIS. Uh, before that, it would be good to have uh, the QGIS installed in your laptops. And um, now why are we doing all this? So the, may, having this exercise or doing this exercise is not the main aim or focus of this workshop. Uh, the focus of this workshop is to understand the connection between water extremes and people and how people react uh, what are the behaviors, whether they participate in certain things, if they do, why they do it, if they don't, why they don't participate in taking up measures or things like whatever things you have heard. So based on these four focus areas, which is in the first page, public perception of climate change risk focused on hydrology, understanding of different socio-environmental vulnerability, advanced tools for understanding risks and developing strategies, and engage strategies for influencing policy in the future. These four focus areas, that will be the focus areas for your presentations. And when, as you are going along uh, with the um, presentations, try to identify which of these four areas these presentations fall into. Once you identify that, uh, it would be good if you identify an area from Brazil, because you know the Brazilian different um, areas better, maybe from your hometown. I know many of you come from so far off areas. So of, of course, it needs to be, it needs to get flooded. Uh, so try to find an area which has water. So, uh, so identify any area of your own choice, and then um, identify the socioeconomic vulnerability around that area. So does it get flooded? How often it gets flooded? What's the frequency of flood? Uh, what's, um, is it 100 year, 200 year? What, what's the timing of the flooding? Um, also, di did it change over time in the last 100 years or so? Uh, just to identify if there is an impact on climate change, things like that. So based on these four focus areas, we will identify slowly we, as we go ahead with the pr um, presentations, we'll identify how people are reacting with nature and try to create this link. And by the end of tomorrow, uh, you will have a presentation uh, in your groups, work in the groups, and now, um, after the GIS exercise, which is an individual work, uh, after that exercise, you work in your groups, and then, uh, based on these four focused areas, develop your presentations. Do you have any questions? I'll be happy to answer. Yeah. OK, so the first task is uh, to identify an area of your choice and uh, get all the socioeconomics, uh, environmental, uh, political, all these aspects around that area to understand the background that you are looking at. And then from there, we will look at the risk or the hazard, the whole cycle, the vulnerability, and then putting them together with the water extremes. What are the problems and what can be the solutions? That's our plan. Does that sound all right? OK, perfect. So uh, you can start working on the exercise. Uh, we have, how much time do we have here? Um, 
we have an hour most probably what's the time now 11, 11. okay up to 12 30 or 12 we are starting we ha okay so we'll go for lunch around 12 o'clock so you have an hour to work on that and then we will be here um, so if you have any questions we'll be happy to answer uh, thank you uh, how many people do we have? I think maximum six people in a group? Yeah, this is the and six more. Okay. Maybe six, people, six four yeah, four groups because we'll have then four presentations tomorrow. Um, if you want to divide it into smaller groups, it's all right because we have time for three presentations each. If we take four presentations, then you will have a bit longer time. And I think that will give us a better idea. So four groups, that's fine. So we'll have four groups then. Thank you.